Hello, friends, and thanks for downloading another weekly episode of the Money Girl Podcast. My name is Laura Adams. I'm a personal finance author, speaker, consumer advocate who's been producing this show since 2008. During the month of April, I've interviewed a variety of guests to celebrate Financial Literacy Month, and today is no different. I've got a terrific interview for you. If you are interested in creating wealth, investing is by far one of the best ways to make that happen. Well, of course, besides winning the lottery or maybe inheriting a fortune, of course. And no matter why you're saving, no matter if it's for a luxury retirement, an Ivy League education for your kids, or just to pass money on to the next generation, investing consistently over time is a very wise strategy that is going to get you to that goal. Problem is, investing can be intimidating. And no one wants to lose money, right? So I think that many people never get started because of that intimidation factor. Or maybe they've got really big misconceptions about what good investing really is. So to bring you some advice and tips from an expert in this field, I interviewed Chris Hill. He's from The Motley Fool. We chat about common mistakes that new and seasoned investors should avoid. Now, if you haven't already heard of The Motley Fool. It's a multimedia financial services company that's been providing advice for investors since 1993. And Chris's role with The Motley Fool is overseeing business strategies and a whole lot of audio programming. He's the terrific and very friendly voice behind two wildly popular podcasts. One is Motley Fool Money, and the second is Market Foolery. Market Fool Money is a weekly show, and it's on more than 50 radio stations across the U.S. as well. It's consistently ranked a top business and investing show on Apple Podcasts and other podcast sites. And Chris interviewed me for the February 28th episode of the Market Foolery podcast, which is a daily show that's also top rated. So be sure to check that out if you haven't already. And today on the show, Chris and I discuss his background, answers to common questions from his podcast audience, and a variety of investing topics, including overcoming barriers to start investing, and why it's actually a whole lot easier than you may think, the best account to begin investing, and how to make it automatic. We talk about the only investment fund you may ever need. Of course, we talk about big misconceptions about investing that you should avoid, how your temperament plays a big role in your investing success, why holding too much cash can be dangerous in the long run, and Chris talks about the sleep factor, which I think is really interesting for an investment. And we talk about the pros and cons of the robo-investing trend and a whole lot more. This is episode number 589 called How to Invest Money Like a Pro, Even If You Haven't Started. Okay, I hope you enjoy this interview with Chris Hill. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really am excited to chat with you. The feeling is mutual. So you are a really busy guy, and I'm really interested to know a little bit more about how you got involved with The Motley Fool. You've been there a long time, like almost 14, 15 years. Is that right? Even longer. I am coming up later this year on my 22nd anniversary at The Motley Fool. So very exciting back in the late 90s when internet investing started to become a thing that people began to understand that they could do for themselves. Survived the dot-com crash of 2001, although it was a very painful year for a lot of companies, including the Motley Fools, and slowly built back up over time. But, um, but I really started out doing media and public relations. I have a background in communication, so that was really my focus. I didn't really start investing in individual stocks until I came to The Motley Fool. This is a company that has a really great culture of learning at it, and so the more everyone can learn, the better. So I've been learning to invest over the last couple of decades, and uh, it's it's really been uh, an incredible ride so far. Explain to people what The Motley Fool does if they're not familiar with it. The Motley Fool was started by two brothers, David and Tom Gardner, 
who were taught how to invest in stocks by their father. And in the early 1990s, when the internet started to become a thing, they got online and and joined chat forums about stock investing um, and decided to start an investment newsletter. Uh, It was just a monthly newsletter that they published. It was 16 pages. They did it with their friend Eric Rideholm. And the idea was to try and teach people about investing and have a little bit of fun along the way. They were both English majors in college. They loved Shakespeare. And so the inspiration for the name The Motley Fool came from Shakespeare's Fools. And if you've never seen a Shakespeare play, The Fool was usually the most amusing character because the court jester was able to have some fun, speak the truth to the king and queen, tell them what was really going on because... Usually, the kings and queens of Shakespeare's plays were surrounded by advisors who were looking out for their own political positions. And so, the jester could tell the truth and get away with it by having some fun and making some jokes. And at the time, there was a lot of conventional wisdom about investing, about Wall Street. And David and Tom Gardner thought, this is an opportunity for us to have some fun, poke holes in conventional wisdom. Um, So that's really where the name comes from. Uh, Over time, the business of The Motley Fool has grown to include a popular website, which is fool.com, books that David and Tom Gardner have written, uh, investment newsletter services. So for people who are looking for stock research or investment ideas, they can... uh, become members of those services. And we also have um, sister companies in other countries and also here in the U.S. that are involved in uh, regulated things like mutual funds, et cetera. So you got involved first in the media and broadcasting side and got into communications. What happened along the way in 2008, 2009 that made you decide, yeah, podcasting is something that we need to get into? So the the company has had two radio shows in its past, um, both hosted by David and Tom Gardner, first in the late 90s on commercial radio, uh, then moved over to public radio, and the show was syndicated by NPR and uh, ceased operations in early 2006. In the wake of the financial crisis, we were, like a lot of companies in the financial space, trying to figure out, okay, how do we best serve our members? How do we get the message out about what we're trying to do? Podcasting, as you know, Laura, was relatively young at the time. And so this was something where we started out really just with the idea of trying to do a weekly show just for one month. We said, let's get in a room. Let's uh, talk to a few of our analysts about what's happening on Wall Street, see if we can help people make sense of the headlines, sort of give our perspective on it. And let's just do it for a month. And if people listen, great. And if they don't, well, we'll we'll try and do something else. We did Motley Fool Money uh, was the name that we came up with for the show. Uh, we did it for one month. We thought, okay, well, let's do it for one more month just to see did it for a second month and thought, okay, we, we feel like we have a little something here. And that was in early 2009. And over time, we've grown uh, the number of podcasts that we're doing to five here in the U.S. Uh, we've got a couple that are uh, international, a, a show in Australia, a show uh, based in Singapore. Um, and as you know, podcasting, if, if you do it right – is something that can be rewarding for everyone involved. It's rewarding for listeners. It's rewarding for you if you're having fun doing it and if you're challenging yourself to come up with uh, fun topics and and interesting ways to come at whatever your topic is. Um, In your case, in my case, we're talking about money and finance. You know there are literally hundreds of thousands of other podcasts. What I often say to people about podcasts is whatever you're interested in, whatever your hobby is, I guarantee you there's a podcast. That's so true. And then in 2011, you started a daily show, Market Foolery, and you were kind enough to have me on that show. So if anybody is interested in listening to you interview me, I was on your February 28th episode. And that's a daily show. What's it like doing a daily show? 
Well, first, I have to say, we got such a great response on Twitter and from email. People were so excited to actually hear from the money girl herself. So thank you for doing that. In terms of doing a daily show, it took a little getting used to because we had just sort of gotten used to doing a weekly show in Motley Fool Money. And doing a daily show, in the case of Market Foolery, it's a show that's largely based around business news. So we look at what are the headlines on Wall Street, what are the stocks and businesses that are making headlines. Let's figure out what we can talk about and, again, try and do it in a, an interesting way that makes sense to people. And when it's earnings season, when there's a lot of news, then it's, quite honestly, a much easier show to do. Uh, when you're doing a news-based show and there's not a lot of news, then you're sort of uh, relying on your wits and creativity um, and listener email. And unfortunately, we've built up a, a good-sized audience so that we do have a pretty steady stream of email from listeners who are, some are asking about individual companies, uh, some are just asking about how do I get started investing? Um, and those are always great topics to go back to. Yes. So you definitely took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to ask about what your emails are like. And I know if you're like me, your inbox is very, very full of questions. Some of them great, some of them maybe not so great. But let's talk about some of the typical types of questions that you are getting. Um, you mentioned just getting started. You know, as you think about answering these questions, how do you approach it? I mean, are are you thinking about, let's do a podcast about it? Are you ever uh, answering people directly on email? How do you handle that incoming load of, of topic ideas? Anytime we feel like someone is asking a question that we can either broaden to talk about a larger industry, or we feel like this is a universal question. This is a question that our listeners are asking whether they are emailing us or not. Um, those are things that we will take and, and use on the show. Um, a lot of times, if it's a very specific question to someone's situation and it doesn't really have a broader appeal, we try and provide some information just responding directly to email that way. Um, but you know, one of the great things about what we've seen over the last 10 years with the largely bull run that the stock market has been on is it increases enthusiasm for stock investing. In that 10 years, we have more young people getting out of college, getting their first job, many of them starting to think about money in a serious way for the first time in their lives. And so it's almost like there's always a steady stream of people who are at a starting point in their investing journey. And we love that. Right. Everybody's at a different point in the journey. And for anybody out there who's looking to get an email answered, I would definitely say one tip is to make it more broad rather than specific. If you give very specific details about your situation and are looking for specific advice, it's probably not, not something that I'm going to be able to answer or Chris is going to be able to answer. But I also look for themes and, and topics that kind of recur and try to kind of lump them together and, and address them uh, when I know that they are issues that affect more people rather than fewer people. So tell me about what you think are preventing or, or what are some issues that may be preventing new people from getting started, since you probably get a lot of emails from people saying, help, you know, this is so confusing. What do I do? Where do I start? Um, what do you think is the biggest barrier to just jumping in? Anytime someone emails to say, hey, I'm thinking about getting started or I am just getting started, we always congratulate them. That's the first thing. It's just like, good for you. It's a big step. Uh, and there's going to come a point in your investing journey when you look back and you realize, oh, it seemed like a big step at the time. But looking back, it wasn't all that big. Because I think the, to answer your question directly, Laura, the number one thing that I think stops people is – it seems intimidating. If you think about the message that has come to us for most of our lives, and it's people who are older like me, and it's people in their 20s or even teenagers, a lot of the times the message that they get 
directly or indirectly about investing is don't do this yourself. You need professional help. This is very difficult. You don't want to do this yourself. Um, and I've had conversations with people who are surgeons, who are lawyers, highly trained professional people who have looked at me with a straight face and have said, boy, I just don't think I, I could wrap my head around investing. And I, as nicely as possible, try to tell them, I promise you, you really can. But I think it is an intimidating thing when you're just starting out. And that's why usually the first thing that we recommend for people, particularly young people just out of college, just starting their first job, is find out if you have a 401k plan or if it's a nonprofit, a, a 403, um, any kind of retirement plan where you can spend a few minutes with someone in your company's HR department, um, make some decisions about what investments you're going to be in. And especially if your company has any kind of a matching program, that's free money. Go ahead and check those boxes. I know that when I was first starting out, when I was out of college, got my first job with an actual paycheck, I didn't want to put money away into a retirement account. This was, at the time, this was the most money I'd ever seen in my life. I was excited to go out and spend it and have some fun. And fortunately, I have a wonderful older sister who pulled me aside and said, look, Go ahead, check those boxes. I promise you, you'll still have money to go out and have fun with, but this is going to be a set it and forget it move that you will be glad you did. And so I think once people can sort of get over that initial intimidation, try and get into um, a 401k plan if you have one. If not, the first step, and for a lot of people, the last step, the only step they need is just buying an S&P 500 index fund. You get a low-cost fund, regularly add money to that. You're buying pieces of some of the biggest companies in America. And over time, the compounding interest is going to work miracles for you. Yes, I do think a lot of people make investing too complicated. In fact, I, I did a podcast that was titled that very thing. Are you making investing too complicated? Um, because for many people, it does seem like they just want to get in the weeds. And the reality is, like you said, a great index fund might be all you need. I mean, it, that, can, that can do the job if that's really all you want to do and all you want to know. And of course, if you want to get deep into it and, and truly understand uh, a lot more about it, you can go there as well. I kind of compare it to driving a car. It's like you can understand understand how the car works and change the oil and, and get really involved if you want to. But if you just want to turn it on and let it be a vehicle that you get from point A to B without knowing anything about what's going on under the hood, that works too. So it really just depends on your level of interest and, and your time that you might have to devote to your own education. Absolutely. And I would say that going back to the intimidation, the fear factor for people who have been hearing for much of their lives that this is too complicated, you can't do that. One of the other great misconceptions about investing is that the best investments are secrets. It's the stock tip that somebody whispers to you at a party, or it's the obscure tech company that you, nobody else has really heard of, when in fact, just the opposite is the case. The best investments, the biggest companies, are the companies that are right in front of us. They're the products and services we use all the time. Um, for anyone who uses an iPhone, Apple has been an amazing investment. The single best investment of my life has been Starbucks. They sell coffee. It's not a complicated business. In fact, it's arguably one of the most simple businesses on the planet. But it has been a phenomenal investment because they do such a great job with it. So I think that to the extent that people can disabuse themselves of the idea that you need to buy shares of a company that nobody's ever heard of, no, a lot of times the best, most rewarding investments are right in front of you. I totally agree. Talk to me about younger investors versus older investors. Do you feel like some millennials, and, and millennials are folks that are uh, right now about up to age 38, do you think some are holding too much cash? Certainly some of the data that I've seen, some of the reporting that I've seen points to that. And I think that 
One of the things that Warren Buffett has said before in terms of, uh, you know, Warren Buffett, arguably the greatest investor of the last hundred years, one of the things Buffett has talked about is the biggest turning point for him as an investor was not learning how to crunch numbers or anything like that. It was when it was mastering his own temperament. It was figuring out how to master his own temperament. And I think that for a lot of people, um, that's a part of investing that goes unappreciated or certainly underappreciated. To get back to millennials, uh, one thing that I've slowly come around to realize is how important our own experiences are in informing the way that we act in our lives. And if you think about where millennials were 10 years ago when they were maybe just getting out of college or maybe they were even in high school, um, the Great Recession happened here in America. And so some of those millennials either had family members or new friends whose financial situations turned dramatically worse. Maybe they lost their house. Maybe they lost a job. And so I understand that experience, how it can inform someone saying, you know what? Cash is something I have in my hand. I can see it. I can save it. And so therefore, I'm not going to risk it in the market because when I was just starting to think outside my own world, America's economy went straight down. So I understand that. But again, to the extent that people can take the long view of history, realize why we went through the Great Recession, and for anyone who has not read the book, The Big Short, or even just seen the movie, The Big Short, I highly recommend both. Um, but I think it helps you understand what we went through, why we're not really in the same situation as a country financially as we were in 2007, 2008. Um, so I understand the desire and sort of the impulse to hold on to that cash, but their future selves are going to be grateful if they look back and realize that, no, actually, the time to start investing for anyone, whether you are just out of college, whether you're a millennial at the older end of the spectrum, or even someone who's in their early 50s like me, the time to start investing is now. What's the downside? What would you say to somebody who says, well, Laura, you know, what if I just keep hoarding my cash and I just am am really diligent about saving money? How would you explain the downside to that? Even though it might seem safe, what could be the danger there? I would say two things to that. The first I'd say is that, and at The Motley Fool, we tell people this all the time, if there's money that you are going to need in the next three years, maybe even up to five years, that money should not be in the stock market. Because while the stock market chart goes up and to the right over time, there are certainly 12-month periods two-year periods where it's a rough ride. And so if you need that cash in the next three to five years, you should have it in cash. You should not have it in the market. Um, But having said that, I think that the risk of holding it in cash is that you really don't know what cards life is going to deal you later in life. You don't know what your health situation is going to be, what the health situation of your loved ones is going to be. It's not really anything we like to think about. Um, I still remember, uh, I'm married, my wife and I have three kids. I still remember um, when we created our last will and testament. And that was really important for us to do. But personally, I found it hard to go through that and think through all the different scenarios because they're all pretty negative when you're thinking about, okay, what if we both die? What happens to our kids who gets custody? You know, all that sort of thing. You kind of have to go through the same mental exercise if you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s and you're thinking, no, I'm going to hold on to my cash because it's working out for me right now. Well, at some point, you're probably going to want to stop working. You're going to want to maybe even go part-time with your work. At some point, Something may happen to your parents, to your children, to your spouse. Um, It it really is going to be um, in the same way that people think about cash as this is my safety net. At some point, not looking to build your wealth and really grow it in a much bigger way than you can if you just keep it in cash, growing it through the stock market, um, that becomes a much bigger risk down the road. 
Yeah, and with inflation at, at you know at least three percent, it's pretty difficult to earn three percent on your savings. So if you're not earning that much, you're really losing ground when it comes to the value of that money. Absolutely. Fortunately, there are online calculators that you can use. Look, when you're first starting out, if you're investing not a lot of money and you're growing it at you know eight percent a year, the, the numbers. Let's face it, the numbers don't look that sexy right off. The, it's hard to get excited about. Oh, I've you know, here's I have eight percent more money than I did a year ago. But you know, Laura, the miracle of compounding interest is what happens in year twenty. 25, the, the growth that you get down the road. Um, if you are able to be patient, if you're able to master your temperament and say, no, I'm not going to worry about the day-to-day movements of the market. I'm more worried about what's going to happen if I don't have enough cash 10 years from now. Yeah, that hockey stick curve is pretty exciting when you get to the point where you see it happening. So, Chris, tell me a little bit about what you think about robo-investing and this whole trend for robo-investing. Do you think it's a positive or a negative? I think you had a great analogy before, Laura, when you were talking about driving. And let's face it, for a lot of people, investing is not something they're interested in. It's not something they want to spend a lot of time on. So, I understand the appeal of index funds and I own an index fund, I understand the appeal of robo-investing. I think the downside, and we see this more and more uh, in the years that we've been doing market foolery, um, because when we see a company comes out with their earnings report, um, a lot of times this AI-driven robo-investing is predicated on speed. And so, if Apple comes out with their quarterly earnings report, it comes out at 4.30 in the afternoon, the market is closed, um, but there's still the trading that happens after hours, and those big institutions that are running uh, robo-investing funds are able to take advantage of this. It's not human beings who are looking at Apple's earnings report and listening to the management talk about the business. It's program that is scanning that document for certain words. And so, we've seen time and time again on our daily podcast, we come in to talk about a stock that dropped dramatically after hours when the report came out, but when the company had their conference call and actual human beings over the next 12 hours were able to look at, well, what did this company really do? What is the management saying? How are they explaining what happened? Then, Actual human being investors look at that and go, "Oh, well, that's uh, this is uh, this is not a problem at all." Um, and so, a lot of times, we see these swings after hours. We see the reverse happen as well. We see the press release gets dropped at four thirty. The stock spikes up after hours because the robo program is looking for certain words. But then, once human beings start to evaluate what's happening with the company, and the company's management gets on a conference call and starts answering questions from analysts, you find out, oh, this this isn't good at all. Um, so, I think that's the con for, for me, anyway, with robo-investing, is I think it can... Um, I think for people who are looking to Get more involved in investing. I think there are better solutions. I think that for people who are into passive investing, I think you're going to be well served and arguably even better served just by simple index funds or basic uh, ETFs um, than you are uh, with some of the robo investing funds that I've seen. What other trends are you seeing from your podcast audience? Given the run of the bull market over the last 10 years, I think we're seeing a couple of things. One is um, people are willing to take on a little bit more risk, which is understandable because for people who have been investing for the past decade or even longer and their portfolios have been built up, then they're able to take a little bit more risk. And so part of what we're trying to do at The Motley Fool is help people figure out um, ways to increase uh, their investments over time and look at things that are sort of through the lens of risk and saying, okay, well, well is this company risky? What are the risks associated with a given business? Um, another thing that 
I think we're we're seeing is, and this is actually, I think, a positive thing as someone who's worked here for more than twenty years. Um, I'm seeing an increase in questions about uh, questions that point to a greater tolerance for risk and a greater understanding of the benefits of long-term investing. And what I mean by that, Laura, is I'm seeing an increase in people who are asking some version of the following question. I bought shares of this company at $50 a share. It's now trading at $30 a share. What do you think I should do? And as you said earlier, there's only so specific, we, you and I can get more answering these questions for legal reasons. Um, but I love seeing an increase in that type of question because it's not, people aren't asking that question out of anger. They're asking it, or even out of fear, they're asking it out of genuine interest. Hey, this company where the stock just went from 50 to 30, do you think something is materially wrong with this business in the long run? And if not, is this actually a buying opportunity? When we go into a department store or we're just shopping on Amazon and we see um, clothing that has been marked down 40%, well, that gets our attention and we think to ourselves, hey, I like a good sale as much as the next person. The stock market seems to be the one place where people don't appreciate a good sale when they see it. A lot of times that's what happens in the stock market. Companies are temporarily on sale. Now, sometimes there's a real good reason a stock went from 50 to 30, and it may be a reason that continues to push that stock down to 10. Um, but I appreciate the fact that m more investors are looking almost clinically at investment opportunities and saying, what should I do rather than panicking? It is interesting that investing uh, does cause uh, this feeling of panic and emotion when the price goes down versus it being, wow, this is a great opportunity. So you do have to be uh, savvy enough to understand that. And going back to what you said and what Warren Buffett said, it really is about our own emotions and being able to make decisions in a conscious way with a clear head. And it's difficult. It's not easy to do, even for the most experienced, savvy investors. So it's a it's an interesting um, discipline, I think, uh, being able to master how you feel about your money. And, and uh, I would encourage anybody who is interested in starting investing to learn more from the fool. Getting involved slowly is smart. And I think trying to understand some of the, the basics and the foundations is really worthwhile. But again, if you're not interested in learning, some of these ETFs and index funds that we've been talking about can do just fine over the long run. Uh, so I don't think you need to feel pressure to be an investor if you don't really want to be an investor. And when I say an investor, I'm talking about choosing a specific stock. Everybody needs to be investing in their retirement fund uh, or, or even outside of a retirement fund if you are able to max one out each year. Uh, and again, if it's just index funds or ETFs that are appropriate for you, that's great. Uh, but if you want to learn more, I would definitely encourage you to listen to Chris's podcasts, go to thefool.com and, and get involved. What else would you encourage new investors to do, Chris? You just reminded me of something that we talk about on the show from time to time, and that is the sleep factor. There is no substitute for the sleep factor. If you have investments that are causing you to lose sleep at night, then that's not an investment worth having. Um, every now and then we'll talk about the worst investments that we've ever made. Uh, for me, the worst investment I ever made was not a stock that went down, although I do have investments of, of companies that I bought where the stock went down. But the worst investment I ever made was about 15 years ago, I bought shares of a biotechnology company. And I can tell you, Laura, I only understood about maybe 50% of what I was reading in the research report, but I felt like I understood it enough to buy shares of this company. And over the next few months, the stock went up about 30 or 40%, and I literally was losing sleep. I would wake up in the middle of the night, and I would find myself thinking about this company and how I didn't really understand what they did. 
And I wasn't sure what I was going to do. And finally, I just thought, this is nuts. And so I did something that we, you know, we don't like to encourage investors to do, but we understand when they have to do it. I sold shares of the stock after just a few months. I sold it at a gain, but of course, I had to pay the short-term capital gains tax, which was higher. But I was able to sleep better. So um, don't ever underestimate the sleep factor. There, there are times in life when you should not trust your gut, but uh, our experience here at The Motley Fool is you should always trust your sleep when it comes to investing. I love it. Chris, thank you so much for joining me and giving us all of your great words of wisdom and all of the work that you've done on podcasts over the years. Uh, I certainly appreciate it, and I hope you'll keep on doing it. It's my pleasure, and it's such a treat to be on, Laura. You are the true pioneer in the money podcast space. So thank you so much for all that you do, and and please don't stop. Chris, I really appreciate your kind words. It was so great having you on the podcast. And a big thank you to everyone listening for downloading the show. Keep listening, learning, and leveraging your resources to grow richer every single day. And before we go, I want to invite you to get a weekly update from me. To get that, please visit lauradadams.com or you can text me. Text the phrase, get updates with no space to the number 33444. The email I send out, it's short and it's filled with some tips, tools, and resources that I think you might enjoy. If you've got a money question, feedback about the show, or ideas for future episodes, I'd love to hear from you. You can send me a note at lauradadams.com or leave a voicemail message. Call 302 302- Three six four zero three zero eight. I'll be featuring a lot of voicemail messages in the next upcoming shows, so make sure your message gets through to me. Money Girl is produced by the audio wizard Steve Rickyberg with editorial support from the lovely Biana Santora. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. That's a super simple, easy way to give back, show your support, and help new listeners find the show. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes that are available at quickanddirtytips.com. That's all for now. I'll talk to you next week. Until then, Here's to living a richer life.